The Great Britain, Sir Winston Churchill, once described Russia as a riddle, wrapped in a mystery, inside an enigma. Of no region is this more true than Siberia, that continent unto itself beyond the Ural Mountains. From the 1,000 waterfalls in Putarana to the cranes on their migration to the south, from the Buddhist temples in Buryatia to the Lena pillars, from the Nikol Juggernaut in Norilsk to the largest forests on Earth, from the reindeer in the polar circle to the Mankukuna rock formations, from the nuclear icebreakers in the Arctic to the walruses in Chukotka. The mysteries of vast Siberia never end. at Lake Baikal, deep in Siberia's south, five time zones east of Moscow. The lake contains more fresh water than any other lake on Earth and is frozen over for at least six months of the year. From December to May, cars can simply drive across its icy surface. There are even traffic signs at some spots on the frozen lake. These two vans are bringing tourists to Ogoy Island, a mecca for photographers. hardly any roads or trails along the 700 kilometer long lake. So in winter, you can finally put the pedal to the metal. The Trans-Siberian Railway travels along the south of the lake. Apart from that, in winter, it's easier to move forward than in summer. Real Lake Baikal lovers look for solitude on skates. A dangerous trip. Cracks in the ice can be up to two meters wide. Today, satellite images help detect them. So our group of photographers may continue to snap pictures safely. Moscow's Yaroslavskaya station is the starting point of what's probably the world's most famous railway. Passengers embarking here on the Trans-Siberian train may not make it to the other end of the world, but they will make it to the other end of Russia, Vladivostok. Almost 10,000 kilometers of track run between here and the Russian Far East on the Pacific Ocean, a journey which takes seven days. From Moscow, the Trans-Siberian Railway was initially meant to improve the trade of goods to China and the transport of raw materials from Siberia. It runs on a southern route through Siberia, while no major rail tracks have yet made the north of Siberia accessible. Nobody then expected passengers, let alone luxury compartments. 
the border between Europe and Asia is invisible and covered with snow. According to geography lessons, the elongated Ural Mountains divide Eurasia, but out here, that sounds a little academic. No matter which continent, in the Republic of Komi, the infinite taiga and the Nordic forest all look exactly as one imagines Russia. From Moscow, there is only one highway leading here. For 200 million years, the Manpupuna rocks have towered into the sky like Europe's border guards, over 40 meters high. The seven columns are the result of powerful erosion. Only the hard quartz slate remains. The nearest village is 165 kilometers away from these rocks. In Siberia, such a distance is just a stone's throw away. At the 3,280 kilometer mark of the Trans-Siberian Railway, the train enters Novosibirsk. The first bridge over the Ob, one of the most powerful rivers in Siberia, was built here in Novosibirsk in 1893. Today's railway bridge looks typical. However, when construction crews arrived here from the west, Novosibirsk didn't even exist. And a bridge had never been built over one of Siberia's rivers. The track workers of that era were the first settlers here. Today, the railway station is one of the largest in Russia, and Novosibirsk is the third largest city in the country, with one and a half million people. Only Moscow and St. Petersburg have more inhabitants. It's no coincidence that the railway town is home to Russia's largest locomotive museum. During the Soviet era, the city was developed into Russia's mysterious research hideaway. So the city today is a high-tech and university location. They're still building bridges over the Ob, but the most recent, most flashy, is only for cars. A thousand kilometers downstream from Novosibirsk, the Ob flows through the deserted taiga. This is the ultimate Siberian landscape. It doesn't get more Russian than this. The Russian taiga is the world's largest forest, stretching 6,000 kilometers from the Urals to the Pacific. The snow forest, as biologists call the taiga's vegetation, loves the cold continental climate. There are few regions on Earth as infinite and enchanted as this. Permafrost patterns cover the landscape. It's too cold here, and the summers are too short for most trees to grow. Permafrost keeps the ground frozen year-round. Only in summer do the uppermost centimeters thaw, 
a paradise for sea eagles. This pair was breeding in the endless swamps near the oil city Surgut. Now, autumn is coming and their offspring have already left the nest. Autumn is a time to enjoy life as a childless couple. Eagle pairs stay together forever. It's just warm enough for plants to grow for only two or three months of the year. Only lichen and moss can withstand these conditions. There's little food for big animals in the tundra. Unless they make do with what's on offer, as the reindeer do. No other mammal this size can survive so far north. In the winter, the reindeers migrate to the woods of the taiga in the south, sometimes traveling thousands of kilometers. But now, it's still possible to find a delicacy or two here. In the middle of the tundra lies the nickel city Norilsk, just near the Putarana State Nature Reserve. the world's northernmost industrial city. And the coldest. It's minus 22.6 degrees in early April. Here, it's all about Norilsk Nickel, whose headquarters are the heart of the city. He is being shot from the air for the first time for this film. Some 170,000 people live and work here in nicely heated blocks. But the lucrative mines for non-ferrous metals were established in the 1930s by prisoners at a much feared labor camp. is still very polluted, but workers here are better paid for their labor than elsewhere. Non-ferrous metals are notorious for the environmental damage they create when they're processed, but they're worth a fortune on the global market as the components of each and every computer needs them. Residents of Norilsk still run serious health risks, but people here have built a life for themselves and their families. The city is considered particularly well maintained. Life is not much different here today than in any other city without the fallout of heavy industries. might be a harsh and even dangerous place. But there are also museums, theatres, cinemas, and a cultural center. People simply seem to live with the fact that life expectancies here are still 10 years less than elsewhere in Russia. The proud inhabitants of Norilsk don't like to be pitied. The 
memorials on the hills honor the forced laborers, without whom the nickel plants in Norilsk would probably never have existed. This can never restore the lives lost, but it can honor the sacrifices made. The Northern Lights. Where skies are clear, you can marvel at this spectacle everywhere in the far north, like here near Norilsk. Electrified solar particles are diverted toward the North Pole by the Earth's magnetic field. When the particles encounter the Earth's atmosphere, they lose their energy and glow. Just east of the industrial city of Norilsk, the Putarana Plateau begins with its uniquely shaped landscape. This satellite image shows the plateau with the folds and fjords carved into it. In winter, it is a frozen desert of snow and ice. In May, the snow melts and everything from the lakes to the smallest tributaries reappears again. It's evident how the water has carved deep canyons in the volcanic rock. Putarana Plateau has thousands of waterfalls and 25,000 lakes. Under Ivan the Terrible, the still unexplored Siberia had yet to be colonized. In 1558, the merchant Stroganov family acquired deeds to the land. For the earliest conquerors, furs were the most important commercial commodity. But shortly afterwards, they began to look for diamonds and precious metals like gold. Finally, energy resources such as oil, coal, natural gas, and uranium were found. Until the 20th century, the transport of raw materials remained a challenge. Only in recent decades have expensive pipelines for gas and oil been built to withstand the climatic conditions. A new natural gas pipeline is being built here, a 3,000-kilometer streak in the landscape. It will deliver gas to China, the world's biggest energy consumer. Russia's revenues from natural gas and oil are still the largest sources of income for the country. In Mirny, in the Republic of Sacha Yakutia, there is a deep diamond hole, and the pole of cold is not far away. Few people would even venture here if it wasn't for the immeasurable treasure underground. The Botobaikinskaya mine unearths diamonds. The mine is worked around the clock, seven days a week. 
Layer after layer of the rocky earth is taken away. one of the deepest holes on Earth was created, the Mirni Diamond Mine, over 550 meters deep. According to a Russian legend, God scattered almost all of his riches across Siberia. Almost 40,000 people live in remote Mirni but many of the miners are flown in especially for their shifts. At the time of filming, mining in Mirny was suspended. Several workers had perished in an accident deep in the mine. Not far away by Russian standards, just 800 kilometers from Mirny, there's another natural wonder. The Lena Pillars. They rise up to 300 meters to the sky. This is a sacred place for the indigenous Evenks and appears to have been shaped by alien forces. Ships navigate on the 3,500 kilometers of the River Lena, but only from June onwards. Until then, it's frozen over. Water penetrating the rock in summer expanded when it froze in winter. The frost cracked the pores and spaces in the rock, creating ever-expanding ravines until these needles stood out. We will follow the River Lena till it flows into the Polar Sea. The true border between Russia and Asia is the Altai Mountains where Russia meets with Kazakhstan, China, and Mongolia. The Trans-Siberian Railway meanders through the valleys at the foothills of the Altai Mountains. Close by, just a few kilometers beyond the Chinese border, in the province of Xinjiang, lies the pole of inaccessibility of the Eurasian landmass. It's about 2,500 kilometers from all the world's oceans. Meanwhile, the Trans-Siberian has already traveled 4,500 kilometers since Moscow. There's always snow on Mount Beluka. The highest peak of the Altai Mountains, 4,500 meters high, on the border with Kazakhstan, the peak of inaccessibility. It's spring in the Altai Mountains. Satbergen and his sons are herding their livestock from the winter to the spring camp as they do every year. Satbergen is glad that his grandson is finally riding with him this time. In Altai, in the southernmost part of Siberia, Russia borders with China, Mongolia and Kazakhstan. Satbergen himself is Kazakh, 
His wife, Euron, is Russian. Four times a year, Satbergen herds his and his neighbor's livestock to pasture and brings them back in autumn to their winter quarters. Temperatures then fall to minus 50 degrees. It's time to move for Satbergen's wife, Euron, too. Euron is helped by her stepson and a friend, who pick her up with a small truck. Together, they are loading the family's entire belongings. valuable property is only loaded at the end. These lambs are still too small to make their way on their own. So the lambs get a ride with the family satellite dish 45 kilometers to their spring home. The rest of the herd has already almost reached the high plateau. The broad plateau here is one of the driest places in Russia. The area only gets 130 millimeters of rain a year. Four times a year, nomads need to move with their herds to look for new pastures. The truck's horsepower has once again prevailed. Satbergen's wife is traveling ahead to the camp to make sure that there will be a warm supper. peaks in Altai, it's bleak the whole year round. Only a few mountaineers dare to venture this high. Foreigners need special permission to travel to this already very inaccessible place. so glaciers at the border normally keep their secrets to themselves. Here, in the wintertime, it can get down to minus 60 degrees. The small town of Koshagach is, at the least, the only paved road to Mongolia. These kids couldn't care less about border issues. The biggest attraction for young people here is the endless frozen playground at their doorstep. As with everywhere in Russia, all forms of Mickey Mouse ears are the latest trend among girls. Boys, on the other hand, play hockey. Today, the residents of Koshagach mostly raise livestock. Only about 8,000 people live here. Life moves at a slower pace here, even for cars. In 
the summer, Altai looks completely different. For three months, until everything is covered with snow again. Hardly any people here, up on the two and a half thousand meter high Ukok Plateau, but there are plenty of camels. The Ob River rises here at the Altai and makes its way three and a half thousand kilometers to the Arctic Ocean. Yaks romp in the endless meadows. Farmers here live in rhythm and harmony with nature. The wild horses on the plateau have also got used to the rough conditions. Bar-headed geese breed here in the Altai, then they're drawn to the south, and before that, even higher up. In fact, they cross the Himalayas to reach their winter quarters in India and Bangladesh. The Trans-Siberian train is approaching Irkutsk and Lake Baikal. When the Trans-Siberian trains arrive in Irkutsk, many tourists disembark at this milestone for a stopover. The river Angara is the only outflow from Lake Baikal, which is only 70 kilometers away. In the early 19th century, many artists, intellectuals and noblemen who rebelled against the Tsars were banished here. Irkutsk was therefore known as the Paris of Siberia, although the wooden architecture resembles more of a frontier town of America's Wild West. On the shore of Lake Baikal, the museum's old steam locomotive recalls one of the strangest anecdotes in the history of the Trans-Siberian. The first route led from Irkutsk directly to the lake. The investors wanted to avoid the mountainous southern end of the lake. There, 60 tunnels and 200 bridges would have devoured 10 times as much per meter of track. Instead, in the winter, the trains ran on temporary tracks across the frozen lake. In the summer, ferries took over the transport until a locomotive sank into the lake. So, in 1904, construction began of the current route. But the museum's old locomotives are still fun today, and not just for men. On Olkan Island in Lake Baikal, ribbon columns watch over the saints. 
the place of worship signals to a large extent that Buddhism is becoming more popular here in the Asian south of Siberia. The Buryats at Lake Baikal are Siberia's largest minority. The monastery at Ivolginsky Dazan has been rebuilt with donations. In Stalin's time, Buddhists were oppressed here, as were most religions. Today, the monastery complex is also a university. only at the end of the 19th century. Today, here is the largest Buddhist temple in Russia. As with all religious minorities, Buddhists too are free to practice their faith. This temple also towers over Ulan Uda, the capital of the Republic of Buryatia. Down in the city, the ubiquitous revolutionary leader Lenin still dominates. It's eight meters high and the world's largest portrait bust. On the outskirts of the city, the Uda flows into the Selenga, the largest tributary of Lake Baikal. The Trans-Siberian Railway is now more than halfway there. The lion at Lake Baikal is one of the most beautiful sections. Migratory birds imitate the trains. The lake is one of the most important resting stops for cranes who can take breaks here along their migration journey. Cranes, the birds of happiness, will migrate from here to India. The more north you go, the more inaccessible, undeveloped and uninhabited the shores are. There are no more roads here. The seclusion of the lake with the largest volume of fresh water on Earth would probably be unimaginable in warmer regions of the planet. Twenty percent of all global fresh water flows through Lake Baikal. This is possible only because the lake is over one and a half kilometers deep. The lake lies between two continental plates which are drifting apart, the Eurasian and the Amurian plates. As they continue to drift, every year Lake Baikal becomes two centimeters wider and deeper. With a current depth of 1,600 meters, it is also the world's deepest lake. If you place the 300 meter high Eiffel Tower on the bottom of the lake, it would look something like this. <laughs> 500 kilometers northeast of Lake Baikal is one of the world's smallest deserts, the Chara Sands. The Chara Sands was formed during the last major ice age water washed sand from the surrounding glaciers, depositing it here. The 
Kodar Mountains, whose glaciers provide the sand for Chara, still tower just 10 kilometers away. Many of its peaks, up to 3,000 meters high, have no name. The Trans-Siberian Railway has reached 8,300 kilometers since it left Moscow. Here in Khabarovsk, trains cross the Amur, the river on the border with China. Khabarovsk, too, owes a lot to the railway. Although this nearly three kilometer long bridge was almost never finished, because it kept sinking in the floodlands. The city was founded as a military post. The border to China is only 30 kilometers away. Behind Khabarovsk, the Amur becomes wider and wider and a bonanza of salmon and moose. We'll see more of this in the next episode of Russia from Above. Seven days after leaving Moscow, the Trans-Siberian train reaches its final destination, Vladivostok. During Soviet times, Vladivostok was a no-go area under the order of the Russian Navy with its Pacific fleet. Today, Vladivostok is just a good hour's flight away from the economic centers of Tokyo, Seoul, and Beijing. In 1916, when the first train entered the station, there were no splendid bridges over the bay, and the world thought in national pride instead of economics. Bridges help.